A few days ago, on April 21st of 2024, was the 100th anniversary of Buster Keaton's 1924 silent comedy masterpiece, Sherlock Jr. Thus, it seems almost necessary for me to properly recommend this stalwart of a film. Sherlock Jr. fits an unprecedentedly high laughs per capita into a concise 45 minute time frame. But throughout this video, I want to make clear that this movie is far more than just great comedy. Naturally, we will eventually talk about the side-splitting humor and why it works later on. But I want to take this time to examine all aspects of what makes Sherlock Jr. such an enduring piece of cinema history, and giving praise where it's due to both the film itself and its genius creator, Buster Keaton. Lucky for me, the structure of this quasi-essay has already been neatly assembled for me by none other than the great French master Francois Truffaut, because of this quote where he says, Comedy is by far the most difficult genre, the one that demands the most effort, the most talent, and the greatest humility, too. Now, I'm not one to usually make such sweeping statements, and in all honesty, not usually one to praise comedies. However, when it comes to Sherlock Jr., it's hard for me to deny that Truffaut is onto something here. Using this quote as our makeshift thesis, we'll talk first of Keaton's unmatched physical effort and the authenticity it brings to his work. Next, we will discuss talent, specifically Keaton's talent for filmmaking, including the wildly progressive techniques used in Sherlock Jr. that often go underappreciated. And finally, we will wrap up by considering the humility required of comedy as a genre, and how silent era stars like Keaton, Chaplin, and Lloyd came to master it. I feel it has almost become cliché at this point to praise Keaton for the bodily sacrifices, or effort, he made for the sake of his art. But, if you are somehow not yet familiar, allow me to introduce you to the functional insanity he brings to Sherlock Jr. Not only does Keaton direct and star in his films, he is also his own stuntman, putting the likes of Tom Cruise to shame. Honestly, even if Keaton wanted a body double, I doubt anyone would have been willing to perform the death-defying stunts he is known for. You see, before these silly little things called labor laws came and ruined everything, you could pretty much do anything you wanted without some nerd breathing down your neck saying things like, we could get sued, or we could die. This movie is the resulting blend of these lax workplace regulations and Keaton's own borderline suicidal recklessness that was needed to take full advantage. To exemplify this, I want to go over a couple of Keaton's craziest stunts in Sherlock Jr. Of course, there are plenty more, but seeing as you'd likely run out of fingers trying to count the times Keaton could have died making this movie, I opted to keep it brief. Here, in an earlier scene, the projectionist slash Sherlock Jr., the protagonist played by Keaton, is running from a police officer when he jumps off of a moving train and hangs from a water spout. And as you watch this man get violently thrown to the ground by a torrent of pressurized water, you may be thinking to yourself, I wonder where they hid the safety cushions. Well, they didn't. And if you want proof, this stunt famously broke Keaton's neck, an injury he wouldn't even notice until nine years later, making him perhaps the biggest badass in cinema history. We could also talk about how he jumps off the roof of a two-story building by hanging onto a railroad crossing bar and landing in the backseat of a moving car. However, the real piece de resistance is the penultimate chase sequence in which Keaton rides on the handlebars of a motorbike, all while narrowly dodging a flurry of obstacles, including dirt being thrown at him, a literal explosion, and of course, a speeding train. It looks as if Keaton is just as surprised as we are that he survived. Now, of course, I'm not suggesting we revert to the way things were in the 20s. There are ways now to perform bigger and better stunts with minimal risk, making this level of commitment near obsolete. Yet there comes with this unnecessary danger a satisfaction in knowing everything you're seeing has actual stakes. Think of it as a circus act. Could you imagine finding out afterwards a sword swallower was using a retractable blade? Or if a ventriloquist was simply playing a recording? their performance would cease to impress entirely. Of course, it is the norm now in films to fake stunts that might put an actor at risk, and obviously, that's probably the way it should be. But let me tell you, there is nothing like seeing the real thing, 
which is why Keaton's physical sacrifices are so foundational to his greatness. Moving past Keaton's physical abilities, I am defining talent in the context of this video as the sum of his technical prowess and natural skill for both filmmaking and full-bodied comedic acting. I'm speaking of the camera tricks, the editing sorcery, and of course his ability to jam as many gags into the script as humanly possible. We'll get to that last one, but for now I want to focus on the first two. Nowadays, Keaton's methods are more or less understood. But back when Sherlock Jr. released in the 20s, several of its tricks baffled cinema fans for decades, wondering just how they pulled them off. Chief among them is the one where Keaton jumps through a tiny suitcase and seemingly disappears behind it. Apparently, Keaton learned this trick from his father, who was a vaudeville performer, but he never publicly revealed how exactly it was done. Supposedly, there is a trap door involved and a second actor laying horizontally. But even after having read the explanation, I'm still confused. Another example of his technical mastery is the entire theater sequence. It starts with the projectionist sleeping in the projector room until he enters a dream state, prompting a second Keaton to come to life a la Phantom Carriage. This is impressive enough on its own, but the biggest shocker comes when the dream version of the projectionist seamlessly walks into the screen becoming an actor in a film within a film. And even though this scene is easily replicable with today's technology, it still remains impressive due to the fact that you are not able to simply chalk it up to digital effects as you would in the 21st century. It's the same as with Keaton's Daredevil stunts. There are no shortcuts, and it serves to make this film even more special. These two scenes I've just mentioned are likely the pinnacle of Keaton's directorial talent, However, one must also consider his talent as an actor. For this, I would like to cite a personal favorite scene of mine. The setup here is that these two co-conspirators have replaced the number 13 billiard ball with an explosive to try and off Keaton's Sherlock Jr. character. But when the wannabe detective goes to play, he miraculously misses the number 13 ball every single time by hitting insane ricochets, curve shots, backspins, at one point, he even bounces the white ball right over top of it. There's something so funny to me about imagining Keaton practicing billiards for hours upon hours trying to perfect this one scene that lasts maybe five minutes. But more than just that, even now, the bit itself is hilarious on its own, and yet so beautifully simple too. Which brings us finally to the comedic aspect of the film, and our last point of discussion. Humility. Now I could be wrong here, but I feel as if the barrier that stops people from watching such films is that they assume the jokes won't really resonate with the modern day post-post-ironic sense of humor. But I assure you this perception couldn't be any farther from the truth. Keaton and his contemporaries are timeless, and it's not in spite of the lack of sound, but as a consequence of it. Without the ability to articulate, the lion's share of the comedic value is derived directly from the physicality of their performances, aka slapstick, a subgenre of comedy often perceived as lazy and unstimulating by modern standards, as if the plethora of alleged smart comedies are in any sense intellectual endeavors. And surely there is some practicality in this blasé attitude towards slapstick, given the slew of sadly uninspired efforts that sully the genre. Yet, I assert that dismissing silent era comedies before experiencing them for yourself is a grave mistake to make. By this point in the video, we've covered that Keaton is one of the most dedicated figures in film history, and a technical genius to boot. Yet perhaps what is even more paramount than these two traits is his refusal to acknowledge them. Though Keaton was a master of cinema, and is celebrated accordingly as we are doing right now, this reputation was never a goal for him, but merely a side effect of performing his main duty, which was to make people laugh. In fact, the first cut of Sherlock Jr., which at the time was titled The Misfit, was scrapped because even though the audience was enamored by the special effects, they simply weren't laughing enough for Keaton's liking. As the true selfless auteur that he was, it was the audience's experience which was always Keaton's primary concern. 
Unfortunately, even the second cut of the film, which became the version we now know, didn't perform much better, and went on to be one of Keaton's biggest commercial and critical failures. And for all the endless praises Sherlock Jr. has accrued among cinema historians over the past century, including its spot among the greatest films of all time, according to the Sight and Sound list, Keaton only ever saw the film as all right, but not one of the big ones. If the audience wasn't happy, neither was he. So it's no wonder he looks back on it with such apathy. Moving forward, another curiosity you may notice is that whether it be Chaplin's signature tramp or characters like Keaton's projectionist, the silent comics had a distinct proclivity for portraying themselves as endearing fools. How ironic is it that they are now looked upon as some of the greatest geniuses in all of cinema? In the short story Babok by Fyodor Dostoevsky, he writes, The cleverest of all is the man who calls himself a fool at least once a month. The reason I bring this up is that it occurs to me that not only were the silent comics not afraid to call themselves a fool, but furthermore, they chose to immortalize themselves as such. While most actors strive to at the very least relate to their fellow man, what makes Keaton and company so special is their ability to place themselves below the common man, a feat no doubt requiring nothing less than the quote unquote greatest humility that Truffaut describes in his article. A perfect example of this involves one of Keaton's go-to techniques for eliciting laughter. You see, by North American standards, Keaton was not particularly tall, sitting at a modest 5'5". Five five. So instead of foolishly trying to make himself seem taller, as a lesser comic might feel compelled to do, he did the exact opposite by accentuating the size disparities between him and his fellow actors, rather than shying away from them. I believe wholeheartedly it is this willingness to be laughed at, his total lack of insecurity, and the relinquishing of ego that are truly Keaton's ultimate comical superpowers. For some, being the punchline of a joke is their worst fear, but it seems for Keaton, it was seen as a badge of honor. So whether you watch Sherlock Jr. for Keaton's audacious stunts, or to be blown away seeing a technical mastermind working at the top of his game, or simply to sit back and enjoy the ageless, side-splitting comedy as Keaton originally intended, there's something in this film for everyone. In any case, it seems clear Truffaut was somewhat right in saying comedy is the most difficult genre, at least where the silent era is concerned. It goes without saying, there will never be another Keaton, or any of his equally impressive colleagues for that matter, unless we somehow reverted 100 years of progress in the film industry, which seems unlikely. But that is all the more reason to appreciate them in the present. The world is split into two halves, those who love Keaton, and those who have yet to see his films. So you might as well get a head start now. And what better time than on the centennial of his masterpiece, Sherlock Jr. But in all seriousness, if you have been unlucky enough to have never experienced the joy of a Keaton picture, I hope I've at the very least intrigued you. And for those who are already familiar, hopefully you got something out of this too. As always, feel free to leave any thoughts about the movie or the video in general down below in the comments, and of course, like and subscribe for more videos surrounding the topics of art house, world cinema, and film history. For now, it's time for me to say goodbye, and perhaps time for you to start watching some Buster Keaton.